Great. Thank you for sticking around to the end of this open data session. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about mapping refugees with open data in National Geographic magazine. Um, so first things first, um, I'm going to talk about a story that went in the April 2019 issue of National Geographic. It was a special issue about cities. Um, I have a couple here which I'm going to pass out. I'm going to do this in an order where we're not going to really see the finished thing till the end. So when you're looking at it, it might be a little out of order, but I hope people get a sense um, holding, holding the paper magazine, sort of what it's like. And also I've put these slides up on the website that is my name. So when I first found out I was going to be working on this issue, um, I didn't really have a lot of details. Someone told me uh, that I would be covering refugee camps. And this is what popped in my head. This is my sort of uneducated assumption and picture of what a refugee camp looks like. It's very dense. It's in a desert. Um, it's fenced in. It's kind of miserable. Um, and this is a, a real camp. This is the Al Zatari refugee camp in Jordan. Um, it's home for a lot of people uh, escaping the crisis in Syria. Um, it's about an, it's an area that's about two miles across and is home to 78,000 people. Um, so this is kind of what I imagined. But I soon found out that actually the story that I'd be covering um, is in Uganda. And Uganda has a significant refugee population. Um, there's over a million refugees there and the population of the entire country is 41 and a half million. A March 2019 ranking put Uganda fourth in terms of countries hosting the most refugees. And for a bit of context, in the United States with a population of over 300 million, uh, we've resettled around 900,000 refugees, but that's since 2001. Uganda is pretty unique when it comes to policy and refugees. Um, in Uganda, refugees can generally move freely they can lease land, and they can work legally. So um, a lot of people have described these as being very progressive, pol uh, pro progressive policies um, that make it possible for refugees to earn an income, have a livelihood in their host country. And the reason some of these policies have been put in place is this um, increasingly common finding that refugees often stay in exile for an average of 10 years. So that's a, a pretty long time. Um, and the writer that I worked with, uh, Nina Strolich, really sort of um, encapsulated sort of why these policies have come together um, in the first place. And I'm going to read a quote from her that was in the story. So for Uganda, the goal, build a livable city out of a refugee camp, one that might endure even if the refugees can return home. So let's zoom in on the specific place that we covered for this story. This is northwest Uganda, um, which is home to a number of re refugee settlement areas. Uh, the largest is called Bidi Bidi. This area is home to more than 700,000 South Sudanese refugees. Um, for a while, it was considered the most populous refugee camp in the world until it was overtaken by the Rohingya camp in Bangladesh. Um, these people here are fleeing a civil war that broke out in South Sudan, which is still a brand new country, uh, in 2016. Though it doesn't really make sense to call this area a single refugee camp. Um, the refugees here live in a number of dispersed zones that look like this. This is an open street map. So a lot of times people call it refugee settlements or refugee zones. I kind of use those interchangeably. Sorry if that gets confusing. So I want to show you an image of what this looks like. Um, the next satellite image I'm going to show is from before the influx of refugees to this area and it's from May 2016. So this is an image from Planet Labs. Um, you can see that this is a very rural area. There's one road, there's a river running through it, there's some small-scale agriculture. Um, the human impact at this time is quite low. Uh, but everything changed in August of 2016. Uh, that's when BDBD was first established. And at that time, an estimated 6,000 refugees per day were entering Uganda. So trees were quickly cleared, and roads were hastily laid to make way for this massive influx. Here's what this area looks like a few years later. As you can see, a lot more dense, 
a lot more roads, uh, a fundamental change. This once rural area is now inhabited by tens of thousands of refugees um, who came in a very short period of time. So now I'm going to show you a photo of, of uh, what this looks like on the ground. Um, and this photo, which is looking down that road to the south in that image, was taken by Nora Lorek, um, who is the photographer of the story, and she took a lot of really wonderful images of this area. And as you look at this photo and consider it, I'm going to read um, another excerpt from the story with more of Nina's excellent writing. She writes, A great experiment is underway in Uganda. An industrial skyline of water and cell towers hovers over sturdy mud huts and small farm plots. Schools and health centers are built from brick, slathered in concrete and fitted with glass windows. Small solar panels power street lights, as well as radios blasting music from barbershops, televisions airing soccer matches in community halls, and cell phones snaking from charging stations in shops. So to me, this place sounds bustling. And whenever I hear about an interesting place, probably like most of us, I look it up on Google Maps to learn about it. So this place looks totally empty in Google Maps. Uh, in fact, it basically looks like as it did back in 2016 when it was still a very rural part of Uganda. Um, and I, I think if, you, if your only opportunity to learn about this place was to put in the search term, you'd either think it was empty or perhaps there was no technology there. Um, but that's not really the case. And that's one assumption that, that I had um, that I quickly learned is false, is that there is quite a, a big availability of smartphones. Um, and the people I talk to who live here and work here say, generally, everyone has a smartphone, or at least each family has a smartphone. And there are plenty of places of charge. And also, the service is supposed to be quite good. Uh, one guy said it's actually better than lots of parts of the United States because it's so flat, and the cell tower towers are quite new. So I'm going to take you through some more wonderful photos by Nora Lorek. Uh, this is an image of a school. It's a permanent building made of brick. Building schools is a top priority in this area. Even if the South Sudanese population is able to return soon, Ugandan officials want schools to be usable for local residents after. And though jobs are often hard to find, there are many entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs who have set up shop, like a hair salon. And people are finding ways to work day and by night. Here's a convenience store. And they're providing services to their neighbors and finding ways to make a living. The seeds of an, of an economy are taking root here. And yes, Uganda has progressive policies for refugees, but this is still an extremely difficult place to live. Residents rely on distributions from the government and other NGOs for basic necessities, like water. Tents are still common here. But despite hardship, cultural and spiritual conditions continue, uh, traditions continue, rather, even if in makeshift settings. BDBD is a community, but it doesn't look like it on Google Maps. If only we had some sort of alternative, not Apple Maps. Oh, something with open data. Oh, open street map. So much better. This looks a lot more like that image I showed you before. So how is this possible? Enter the humanitarian open street map team. They're a nonprofit, and they're dedicated to humanitarian action and community development uh, through open mapping. I was familiar with the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, and they do use the acronym HOT, but I find that to be very distracting, so I'll probably just say humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. Um, has anyone participated in one of their uh, mapathons? Yeah, awesome. Quite a few people. They're amazing. They're really cool. It's a really awesome way to contribute, not with money, but with effort, and for us cartographers, using a skill. It's great. Um, it, mapathons are really great, but they do have limitations. Um, they're great for filling out the base map, or kind of how I think of it, uh, providing the skeleton of the map. But you can't tell a hair salon from a convenience store by looking at a satellite image when you're tracing it. Um, but what is amazing about BDBD in this area uh, is that if you zoom in close enough, you start to see that there are a lot of individual points. Um, there are stores, there are water shop, or there's a water tap, 
Uh, there's pharmacies, there's a health center, there's all the things we saw in the photos, and they're actually here in OSM. So I want to tell you about how that's possible, um, and then how we told that story in National Geographic. There's a lot of people who are responsible for this, but one specific person I want to give a shout out to is this guy, Rupert Allen. Um, he's the former um, hot Uganda coordinator, um, and he was an amazing source for this story. He told me a lot about what was happening on the ground in these long, rambling, two-hour phone calls, um, which was excellent. Um, and part of what he was responsible, responsible for uh, was setting up uh, the Kobo toolbox, or a Kobo server in this area. And basically, um, this Kobo toolbox allows um, the creation of these surveys um, to be put on smartphones and then quickly integrated back into OSM. So Rupert helped employ and enable local refugees to go out with these surveys and collect huge amounts of data. Um, and now I'm going to show you some examples of this. So um, we saw open, uh, we heard about Overpass Turbo earlier. It is an awesome tool. I use it a bunch for this, and it's a really great way to see uh, what's been mapped in this area. So what we're looking at here is schools in the Yumbe district. Um, and I'm not a, a, like a really proficient coder, but I found querying over past tur a turbo is not particularly difficult, especially if you have one example to go off. You really just have to change a couple of parameters, the area that you're looking at, um, and if you can click on any node and look at its list of attributes, um, it's not difficult to build the queries that you want to see certain things. So if we do click, click on one of these schools, we can see the crazy amount of information that they've been uh, recording about these. There's 17 tags just for this one node. Um, and like we heard about already, an awesome thing about OSM and for the humanitarian open street map is that they can create their own tags for specific cases that might be relevant specifically to a certain camp or this specific effort. I'm gonna call out two tags that I think are important. Um, amenity tells us about the type of school. And in this case, they were tracking the sanitation facilities at these schools. For example, this school did have toilets. And this is hugely important for NGOs and officials working in this area for doing analysis. Uh, here we can see the schools in this district that are lacking sanitation. It has a profound impact on the attendance at these schools. Um, it's difficult to go to a school where there's no place to go to a bathroom. So they're able to target resources better. So now I'm going to take a sip of water and we're going to transition um, to how we map this in National Geographic. So I knew I would be working in the cities issue, and I knew it would be confined to just a single page in the magazine. Um, rather than try to map out the whole camp, which is that huge, discontinuous, kind of crazy to look at area, I decided to just focus on one area, and specifically the area that Nora and Nina were able to visit. Um, and I knew that Rupert was familiar with the area and I had access um, to contact some of the Ugandan mappers and South Sudanese mappers in the area. So I could send them annotated screenshots to act, ask them questions, which was really helpful. So we had a location. Um, I decided that the primary way I wanted to visualize BDBD was with satellite imagery because I felt that it would just paint a really vivid picture of what it looks like there and would be helpful for the readers. So I needed to get an image, and this ended up being much more difficult um, uh, than I thought. So here's the first um, Google Earth screenshot that I took of the lat long in the area, and I started contacting Digital Globe um, to see if they could help me get an image. Um, this image was, was a good resolution, but it was kind of out of date, um, and you can't really tell here, but the, the tile ends very quickly, and I wanted to show a little bit more. So I thought we could do better. Um, they gave me a few options, uh, focusing on this area. And uh, we didn't have much luck. <laughs> I got another image that had much better resolution, um, but this looked like a desert to me. And the photographs in the story showed much more lush vegetation. And I, I didn't want to create confusion for the reader by using this image. So then I turned to Planet Labs. And luckily, I knew Leanne, who's sitting with us helped me uh, acquire some different images. Um, once again, though, the first pass didn't prove to be the best. Uh, a cloud and a cloud shadow is sitting right where I was hoping to map, 
And there's also this crazy reflection just on two buildings, and I'm not sure how that happens. Um, but what's amazing about Planet is they have the ability to task certain satellites to fly over areas. So on June 10th, a SkySat passed over BDBD and captured this amazing image at 72 centimeter resolution. It's so detailed, we can even see a single fire burning in this field. It's, when this happened, when this image came back, I thought, wow, we really do live in the future. This is crazy. <laughs> so we have our image now, and the resolution is great. I'm going to put it into Photoshop. So here's our original image in Photoshop, and I'm going to walk you through some of the things I did. Um, this really builds upon Soren Wall Jasper's awesome talk about things that we do at Nat Geo um, with images to make them more clear. Uh, one of the first things I did is I, I used a high pass filter. Um, this filter is kind of buried in the other filters menu if you haven't seen it before. But basically, it's a crispiness filter. Um, and it crisps up the edges. Um, and when you basically duplica duplicate your image, put on a high pass filter, um, and then overlay it, you can kind of crisp it up more, which is really awesome for showing buildings and the edges of distinct things like roads. Um, I used Dodge and Burn to highlight some specific buildings and areas that I wanted to pop out a little bit more. Um, and these would be accentuated later with leaders and circles. Um, and then it was just color adjustments. <laughs> lots and lots and lots of color adjustments, probably for weeks, and printing them out and going, ah, this looks too washed out, this looks too saturated. Um, but the main things that I used uh, were curves adjustment, contrast adjustment, and the saturation. Uh, the, the, thing, the key thing here was to make an image that would be able to support uh, vectors on top of it. So then I brought this guy into Illustrator. Um, and one of the first things I decided to do was actually rotate the image a little bit. Um, there's this really distinct right angle um, road feature right here. And I felt like it was just a little bit more legible to show that this area was quickly laid out in a grid. And in terms of a rectangular page, it was just easier to make the layout um, happen with this. Then I got points from uh, exporting from Overpass Turbo, and I brought them into Map Publisher. So here's a little look at our attribute table at some of the water facilities. Um, and then I developed a symbology. So these are the different symbols I created for a water pump, for a store, for a church, for a medical facility, for a mosque, for a restaurant, for a school. Honestly, I just borrowed very directly from popular mapping applications. I didn't try to reinvent the wheels with this, but I looked for a color palette that would work good on top of green uh, with a good contrast and try not to have color blindness issues. Um, what's awesome about having the attribute table and map publishers, I could see a lot of the cool um, notes that the refugee surveyors had been able to um, pull in. So for instance, for these different pumps, we could see whether they were powered or manually operated. Um, we didn't note this, but I think it's really cool that they have this lit tag, which indicates whether or not there is a light um, at the water source, um, which is actually hugely important for safety if someone needs to go down to get water at night. Um, there were other things that didn't show up in OSM, um, but I was able to contact people directly and ask about things I was seeing in the image and learn a little, these little awesome little tidbits. So for instance, we can see a big tree where people gather and there's paths rating out from it. Um, there's solar powers, solar panels. Solar is one of the primary ways that the smartphones are charged, which is why any of this is even possible. Um, yeah, and another thing that I did is that I, I decided to create an inset at the most dense part. <clears throat> oh yeah, and the other, other thing too is that you can see there's one building that existed in 2016 Everything else was not there before 2016 in this area, which is crazy. Um, so for this inset, I decided to show a vector version of this. And I basically just used the way OSM looked, and I wanted to give a feeling of sort of the different ways of representing. And I, I think it was said really well by Alan that OpenStreetMap is more of a database, but this is what it look, these things look like on OSM. <clears throat> and of course, there was a key, and we tried to give some good uh, information about um, each of these facilities and what made them special and why it was so important. And we did filter out. We're not showing everything, but these five places I thought were really um, integral to the story. And here's the final spread that we ended up with. Um, I was able to convince the designer to give me a tiny bit of room to do a locator 
of Africa and the northwest part of Uganda on the opposite page. Um, and I'm going to wrap it up here. So as I was making this, I kind of had a little bit of a crisis because I realized this looks like Google Maps. And as we saw earlier, the, I was kind of trying to get away with that because Google Maps didn't really actually do a good job of showing this area. And I thought, wow, this is just horribly uncreative or I'm fitting this you know, super Western lens, very American-centric type view on top of this place, which is so different. I don't really know anything about it. I was kind of freaking out a little bit. Um, but then I kind of thought about the larger issue that this was fitting into, into cities. And I realized that Google Maps and OSM as a tool for us to navigate is something that we expect from a modern city. And I do think that what humanitarian OpenStreetMap has done here um, is help build one of the key attributes at a modern city in a place that would otherwise just be called a ref refugee camp. And it's part of the important parts of making this place not just a camp, a temporary place, but a more permanent city. So I don't know if that approach was the right approach. I'm interested to see people have other ideas. <clears throat> but I think it worked out in the end, and I was happy with it. Um, and BDBD is an amazing place. So thank you, Nasus. Y'all are awesome. That's a website you can go to to learn more about me and follow on Twitter. Thank you, thank you.